Ataxia is a term used to describe the inability to perform coordinated movements as well as difficulty maintaining certain positions. Ataxia can affect almost any region of the body. Ocular motor control, limbs, hands, feet, gait, truncal stability. The underlying ideology of ataxia is basically a result of a disruption in communication amongst areas of the nervous system that are responsible for the coordination of movement. Individuals with cerebellar ataxia can display a variety of neurologic signs. Some of these include abnormal eye movements, dysarthria, intention tremor, dysmetria, dysdiatokinesis, a characteristic abnormal gait, and postural instability. In discussing each of these, abnormal eye movements can include nystagmus as well as uh, undershoot or overshoot. For example, when testing a patient for ataxia or problems with eye movements, one might ask them to look at an object and to vary between the examiner and the object. When looking at either the examiner or the object, instead of their eyes going directly to the target, they might overshoot the target and then come back. And that might be due to an ataxia or cerebellar dysfunction. Regarding intention tremor, this is a tremor that usually occurs during voluntary movement. For example, if someone is trying to reach and touch the tip of the pen, somebody with an intention tremor, as they get closer to the target, they might have a little bit more difficulty. Dysmetria is usually the undershoot or overshoot of an intended position. It could be dysmetria of the eyes, as I've already described, or it could be in testing finger to nose or heel to shin. On finger testing, one might ask the patient to touch a target and somebody with a dysmetria might overshoot or undershoot the target. And this could occur with the leg or the arm and is often due to cerebellar dysfunction. Dystidokinesia is the impairment of alternating movements such as pronation supination or the movement of the hands um, in rapid alternating movements. Somebody with dysdiatokinesis, due to a cerebellar problem, will often have irregularity in the movement. Somebody with Parkinsonism just might be very slow, but would be regular. And it's usually the irregularity that is more of a cerebellar problem. A characteristic gait from a cerebellar disorder would often be wide-based. There might be unequal steps. There might be lateral deviations or deviation from one side to the other basically an inability to maintain a straight line, and also an abnormal pattern of stopping and starting. Lastly was postural instability. There's often considerable difficulty w with a patient performing tandem walking, such as heel-to-toe walking, and truncal sway may be evident when a patient is trying to maintain a standing balance or sometimes even sitting. The causes of cerebellar ataxia include a broad range of neurologic disorders. When assessing a patient with a cerebellar ataxia, the examiner should consider several different possibilities for the underlying ideology. Some of these might include stroke, trauma, tumor, an exogenous substance such as alcohol, anti-epileptic medications or other drugs, uh, recreational drug use, as well as neurodegenerative diseases that would differ between children and adults. One might consider diseases such as multiple system atrophy, Jakob Kreutzfeldt disease or CJD, um, Huntington's disease. In children, one might consider various disorders of development, uh, ataxia, telangiectasia, neuroacanthocytosis. There are many neurodegenerative disorders that can result in cerebellar ataxia. This video shows a left-handed patient with a midline and an asymmetric limb ataxic syndrome due to antineuronal autoimmune antibodies, specifically anti-GAD65 antibodies. On finger-to-nose testing, note that she has some very mild left arm ataxia. 
Note, at the end of the finger-to-nose movement, when attempting to touch the examiner's finger, she has difficulty precisely touching the target, often undershooting or overshooting. This is a very subtle sign of ataxia in this patient and is called dysmetria. Note that it is important to test dysmetria by having the patient try to fully extend the arm. If the examiner does not do this, they may miss more subtle forms of dysmetria. On the patient's right sh side, she shows much more profound ataxia that is present throughout most of her movements, which worsen as she gets closer to the examiner's finger. This suggests that she has worse right rather than left cerebellar hemisphere dysfunction. Similarly, on heel to shin testing, she does much better. In fact, she is relatively normal on the left side, but she has severe ataxia or dysmetria on her right, being barely able to perform the task. On gait testing, we see that she's very wide based with difficulty turning and maintaining an upright balance either while standing or walking. She cannot even maintain an upright posture when attempting to stand with her feet together, even with her eyes open. Her midline and gait dysfunction suggests that she has a problem with the vermis of the cerebellum, which is a midline structure in the cerebellum. Her problems with limb dysmetria suggest that there is a problem with the cerebellar hemispheres, or the lateral aspects of the cerebellum.